Intertrochanteric femur fractures. This is from the OTA Resident Core Curriculum Lecture Series Version 5. Uh, the slides are by Dr. Michael Blankstein, and I'm Sakib Rahman narrating. So the objectives of this lecture are to go through preoperative considerations of intertrochanteric femur fractures, classification, uh, talk a lot about stable versus unstable fractures, uh, implant choice, intraoperative considerations, and postoperative management. And we'll break this up into three videos. So it's quite a journey for the patient with the hip fracture, coming to the hospital, getting worked up, getting medically optimized, going to surgery, a lot of decisions along the way, uh, all the way through to discharge. And I would argue it doesn't end there. It continues um, in the transition to the uh, outpatient side, uh, whether a patient goes to a rehab facility or goes home, and then um, following through uh, with the surgeon as well as uh, osteoporosis management. So a standardized care pathway is key. These are common injuries. Many hospitals are going to see a lot of these. So uh, these are not isolated injuries, and you really can have a standardized uh, pathway to improve outcomes. Um, this can include uh, medical co-management, multimodal anesthesia. We found that uh, delirium can be minimized, uh, pain can be in, in improved with uh, things like uh, nerve blocks, for example. Um, Co-management can really help for uh, preventing polypharmacy. Um, there is issues uh, regarding anticoagulation that can be improved with a standardized pathway. Uh, timing to surgery is important. So uh, in this study in uh, uh, JAMA, um, uh, Journal American Medical Association, large, large study, 43, uh, 42,000 patients, risk of complications and 30-day mortality were increased when wait times to surgery were over 24 hours. So you want to get the patients to the OR within a day. What about echoes? Well, because, uh, you know, these are elderly patients. A lot of times the patient comes in and, uh, you know, internal medicine wants to get an echo. So this has evolved. Um, routine evaluation uh, for LV function is not typically recommended uh, except for new or worsening heart failure. Stress testing is only recommended if it's going to lead to innervation, intervention that's going to change management. Um, despite these guidelines, uh, you know, a lot of physicians, uh, you know, feel that, you know, if they want to adequately clear or medically risk stratify your patient, uh, that they are going to go ahead with these tests and, uh, these can lead to significant delays. Um, so this is something that I think we've certainly, uh, improved over the last five to 10 years, but, um, uh, still is not, uh, as optimized as it could be at many centers. Um, what about co-management? We talked about this before. Dr. Stephen Cates has uh, reported on this uh, frequently. In this particular study, they compared hip fracture outcomes at two hospitals, same orthopedic and anesthesia departments. At one hospital, patients were admitted to a co-management service, and at the other hospital, they received usual care. Um, and the patients in the co-managed group were operated on sooner. They had fewer infections. They had overall fewer complications and shorter lengths of stay. So what you would imagine should be the case has shown to be the case in many studies. Um, so hip fracture care that incorporates co-management by a geriatrician, for example, and an orthopedic surgeon uh, with standardized protocols and total quality management approach can lead to improved processes and uh, clinical outcomes. So is there a role for non-operative management? Well, it's very limited, right? So um, non-operative care is associated with generally increased mortality. Uh, in this particular study, um, non-operative care, 84% one-year mortality. So not a good overall prognosis. So in general, most geriatric hip fractures, um, you know, we're considering surgery for, although certainly not in 100% of cases. There are cases where that may not be the, uh, the indication. 
What if you have an occult fracture? What if there's a fracture, a patient comes in with hip pain, you get an MRI and you find a non-displaced hip fracture? Well, it's a somewhat small study uh, by the uh, author of our uh, slide deck, but um, showed that um, in, in this cohort that um, femoral neck fractures, you have to be a little bit more careful of uh, because if they can go on to displace, but uh, non-displaced intertrochanteric fractures, at least in the nine patients here, um, did heal non-surgically. So if you have a non-displaced MRI only uh, intertrochanteric femur fracture, I think it is worth questioning um, if that absolutely has to go to surgery. So you really do have to think about this, and I think a little bit more of a conversation with the patient and family um, as to whether or not uh, they want to proceed with surgery. Um, so what about workup? Um, so here you can see on the left um, a, an intertrochanteric femur fracture. With traction view, you can get a sense what it might look like uh, if you put the patient under traction, like on a traction table in the operating room. So this can be painful for the patient, may not necessarily be routinely needed, uh, but if you have a very confusing fracture pattern and maybe the patient's very externally rotated and maybe it's a basic cervical femoral neck versus an inner trochanteric femur and you can't tell, um, or if you can't recognize the comminution, sometimes you have to get somewhat of a AP view and that may require holding the patient's limb, and if you're going to do that, um, sometimes just getting a slight traction view can demonstrate what the fracture looks like, and a good lateral is helpful as well. These are extracapsular fractures, so they have good healing potential. So when you think about femoral neck fractures, they're intercapsular. You have this cortical bone being bathed in joint fluid, uh, not a great setup for healing. Uh, therefore, you really have to, you know, get good cortical contact with those femoral neck fractures. But intertrochanteric femur fractures, they're extracapsular. They have great, you know, there's cancellous bone, good healing potential. So these are always going to be fixed. You don't have to replace these. Um, so stable fractures will resist medial compressive loads when reduced, and unstable fractures are going to collapse into varus, or the shaft's going to displace medially. And we'll talk a lot about this concept. So when you see an intertrochanteric femur fracture, you got to decide, is it stable or unstable? So in the OTA fracture classification, um, the femur or the intertrochanteric femur fractures are 31 because uh, it's the third bone, and then one is the proximal bone. So you have 31A uh, as shown here, and if you break it down further, that concept of stable versus unstable, so these are sort of the stable intertrochanteric fracture types, right? So two-part fractures or a lesser choke off with a stable lateral wall, as opposed to disruption of, you know, this, this probably better shown here, disruption of the lateral wall or fracture that goes right through the lateral wall, uh, or you may have, you know, basically a separate fragment here. Um, so lateral wall incompetence or reverse obliquity, uh, equivalent injuries, uh, as shown below, um, these are potentially unstable, and we'll talk about that some more. So surgical goals are to obtain neck shaft axial alignment, correct rotation or translation. Uh, you don't have to get absolute anatomic reduction of like those intermediate fragments, uh, like the lesser trochanter, for example. Um, your goal is to get this patient to the OR within 24 hours, relatively as soon as possible. Uh, make sure you have the ideal implant selection, get a good reduction, and make sure that implant is put in properly. Closed reduction usually works. Typically, traction, internal rotation, a deduction, as shown on the right lower extremity here in a track, on a traction table. Um, when you're doing traction, you can err a little bit on the side of valgus, certainly not varus. Uh, if there's posterior sag, you may want to use something underneath the limb. Uh, a crutch sometimes can work if there's significant posterior sag. Other aids to get reduction include a ball spiked pusher, bone hook, clamps, um, often not needed but uh, can be considered. What about implants? Well, the sliding hip screw is a mainstay. Cephalomedullary nails are also 
very commonly used. Question about whether to use long versus short nails. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Blade plates rarely used for these. So the sliding hip screws and uh, cephalomedullary nails allow for fixed angle controlled collapse, you know, to allow some shortening at the fracture site to allow for healing. And here's an example by the author um, showing a 82 year old female, low energy fall. Uh, there's a traction view on the right. You can see the inner choke enteric femur fracture. It looks like there are four parts, but uh, here you can see intraoperative reduction, guide pin placed, and uh, this is a um, cephalomedullary nail with um, satisfactory overall, overall reduction of the main fragments. You can see a lesser choke cancer, of course, does not need to be directly addressed. And this is an early follow-up. So this is a short cephalomedullary nail. Okay, we're going to pick up here um, in the next video. So we'll pause here. Thanks.